So this is chapter 11. This is about one to many relationship strategies. And I love to start off the strategy section with this chapter because it's so different from a relational database. You know, in a relational database, there's basically one way to handle a one to many relationship. But in this chapter, we're going to see five different ways on how to handle it in DynamoDB. So this is what we're going to cover here in this chapter. First off, we'll start off talking about what is a one to many relationship, and then we'll just walk through five different strategies for handling one to many relationships. The first two are both going to involve denormalization, and that's denormalization with a complex attribute or denormalization by duplicating data across multiple items. Then we'll look at using the primary key in that query operation to handle one to many relationships, as well as a similar pattern of using a secondary index plus that query operation. Finally, we'll look at highly hierarchical data using a composite sort key. Let's start off with what is a one-to-many relationship, just so we're on the same page there. A one-to-many relationship is whenever you have two items that are related to each other in sort of a parent-child relationship, and that parent entity can have multiple related sub-entities. So a few examples here would be an office and employees. You know, multiple employees can work at a single office building, so that office is that parent entity and the employees are those related sub-entities. Likewise, you can have a customer in orders because hopefully at your online store, customers are making lots of orders. So a customer has multiple orders over time. Last one, organization and users. We've seen that with our SaaS example. An organization can have multiple users that belong to that organization. So let's move on to our first strategy, which is denormalization with a complex attribute. I'll first show an example of it in action, and then we'll talk about why that's denormalization and when we would want to use this. So let's imagine we have an online store, an e-commerce store, where customers can sign up. And one thing we allow them to do for convenience is save different mailing addresses to their account. And they can save multiple addresses. So we have a one-to-many relationship here where a customer is going to have multiple mailing address. In any individual address will belong to a single customer. And the way we're going to model that out is just adding an attribute on that customer itself. So we're going to add this attribute. This is going to be of type map. So we talked about those complex attribute types. We're going to use a map. It's like a dictionary. And we'll just have this mailing address as attribute there. And now we have a few different named addresses. So you can see that Alex Debris has a home address, has a business address, and Jeff Bezos has saved a home address as well. Now we talked about normalization back in chapter seven and the first rule of normalization, if you're gonna to get to that first normal form is that all values must be atomic. So that's why we're violating that here. We're denormalizing our data by putting a complex attribute, a map that could be broken down further. It's not atomic, but it does help in this situation. So again, just a summary of what we're doing here, you're gonna represent related items as a list or a map on that parent item. This is good when two things are true. First of all, you don't have any access patterns on the related items directly outside the context of that parent item. So we don't have any access patterns that say, hey, get a user by its address, where we don't know the user, but maybe we have the address and we want to look up the user. Um, additionally, it, it also works if you have a limited number of related items, and that's due to that 400 kilobyte limit on that DynamoDB item. So if you had something that had an unbounded number of, of related items there, you wouldn't want to use this because there's it's possible you could overflow that 400 kilobyte limit. Now, with something like addresses, it's pretty reasonable for us to say, you know what, you can you can save a lot of addresses, but maybe you can only save 20 or 30 max, we're not going to allow you to save more than that, just to make sure we're never going to go over that 400 kilobyte limit. Let's move on to our second strategy. It's another denormalization strategy, but this one is denormalization plus duplication. The example here that we're gonna use is, imagine you have books and you have authors. And if you had a relational database, you'd split these across two different tables so that books would be in one table, authors would be in the other, and you'd join across those. But again, we don't have joins in DynamoDB, so we're gonna make do with something else. This is what our DynamoDB table looks like. So you can see we have a few different books by Stephen King, one by JK Rowling there as well. If you look there, we have that author birth date for Stephen King s stored on two different items. So we're repeating that info across multiple items. And if we think back to our lesson on normalization back in chapter seven, to get to second normal form, you need to make sure that all non-key values must depend on the whole key. And remember, the key is what uniquely identifies each individual record. So if we go back to our table, to uniquely identify each individual record, we need both the author name and the book name. But that author birth date, it doesn't depend on the whole key. It doesn't matter what the book name is. Stephen King's birth date doesn't change across different books. So that author birth date is only depending on part of the key rather than the entire key. So that's uh, violating second normal form. So let's summarize what this strategy is and when you would want to use it. 
what you're doing here is you're copying parent data across all related items. So Stephen King is that author. He's the parent there and you're copying information about him across each of his book items. Now there are a couple questions you should consider if you wanna use this strategy. Number one, is that duplicated data immutable? So in this case, it's the author's birthday. It's not like Stephen King's birthday is gonna change. We don't have to really worry about that. So that's immutable. But if that data can change, if it was something else like Stephen King's address, now we need to think harder about that because if we do, we're gonna have to update a lot of different items. So that gets us into the second consideration. If that data is not immutable, how often does it change and how many items have that duplicated data? So if it changes, you know, maybe once a year, it's very knowable, you know, maybe you still duplicate this data and take that update hit that once a year. And, and likewise, you know, if there are only two items that have this data duplicated across it, maybe it is pretty easy to update that when that data does change. But if it changes quite a bit or if it's duplicated across a lot of items, you might not want to use this strategy. Let's move on to the third strategy, and this is going to be the most common strategy that I use and probably you use. And this is when you use a composite primary key plus that query operation. So let's go back to that SaaS application that we've used a few different times. Again, what happens here is different organizations sign up for our SaaS application and they have users that belong to that organization that can use that SaaS application on that organization's behalf. Now, if you look here, what we have is we have an item collection that contains both the organization and the user item. So let's just outline that. In red is that, org that Berkshire item collection. It has everything about Berkshire. In green there, you can see that organization item itself is stored in there, but also the user item. So there's a one to many relationship relationship between the organization and all their users. And what we're doing here is we're combining them into the same item collection. So how this strategy works is that you place that parent and the related items into the same item collection. And then you can use that query operation to retrieve both types of items in a single request because you just specify that partition key. Maybe you have some sort conditions, but basically you're getting these different types of items. And this is just like joining your data. Again, I said this is the most common strategy for one-to-many relationships because you're getting that join link behavior. But instead of joining at read time, you're joining at write time by pre-joining them, writing them into the same item collection. Let's move on to the fourth strategy, which is using a secondary index plus the query operation. This strategy is very similar to the last one we did, and it's pretty common as well, probably the second most common after the previous one. Let's see why it's useful. Again, we'll use that SaaS application that we have, but imagine we have a new entity now. Maybe in our SaaS application, users can create tickets, and tickets belong to particular users, and so there's that one-to-many relationship there between users and tickets, and you have some access patterns that say, fetch a user, fetch all the tickets for that user. Now you might take the principles from the last strategy and apply them here. So you put those ticket items right there, you put them right after the user to which they belong. And now it makes it easy to say, to go to that partition, use some sort key conditions to get a user and to get the user's tickets. But remember, we still have this previous access pattern we have, where we wanna get an organization and all the user items. And if we look back here, now when we wanna get an organization and all the users, we're also gonna pull back all these tickets as well. And what's likely here is that ticket item is gonna vastly out, outnumber the user items because a user can have multiple tickets. So now every time you handle that get user, get or get organization and get user access patterns, you're also pulling in all these tickets that you don't want. So let's handle this in a different way. Instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the tickets in a different item collection entirely. They'll be in their own item collections down here. Also, what you see is that we have these GSI 1 PK and GSI 1 SK attributes, and these are on all the user items and all the ticket items. And if you look at the PKs for those, you can notice that uh, a user and its ticket are gonna have the exact same GSI 1 PK. So then when we create that GSI, using that GSI 1 PK and GSI 1 SK values for our primary key, they're gonna be located in the same item collection. So here's our GSI 1 primary or secondary index here, you can see that Charlie Munger has both his user item and the tickets in that same item collection. So then we can, just like we did with that uh, primary key and query, we can use the query on this secondary index, find the right item collection to get both the user and the ticket items and, and make that join. Let's cover what we're doing here with this strategy. Again, we're placing the parent in related items in the same item collection, but the important thing here is that that's happening in a secondary index rather than on the primary key in our base table. Again, we're using that query operation to retrieve both in one request, just like we did with our last strategy. This is useful if that primary key is already being used for something else. So in this case, you know, it was being used for a different access pattern. You could be using it to handle uniqueness or some other thing. So if your primary key is busy doing something else, then you just put this off into a secondary index and you can still handle that same pattern.
The last strategy we have here is what's called a composite sort key. And this is different from a composite primary key. Remember, a composite primary key has two parts, a partition key and a sort key. When you use a composite sort key, what you're doing is you're encoding multiple values into that sort key that allows you to filter on different levels. Let's take a look because this can be kind of confusing. Imagine you had a, a corporation that had a bunch of store locations and you wanted to have all those store locations in your table across the world here. What you could do is do this. You'd use that uh, country as the partition key and then your sort key would look like this and it has multiple values encoded into it and we call that sort key city, state, zip and then it has an ID as well. So what we have is each sort key will include multiple values. It'll be the state, then the hat, then a hash, then the city, then a hash, then the zip code, then a hash, and then the actual store ID. And what this allows us to do is fetch at multiple levels in that hierarchy. So let's take a look at a simple example in code here. We have our query operation. We're querying, querying our Starbucks tables that has all these different locations in it. And for this key condition expression, we're doing an exact match on our partition key as we need to using USA as the country. And then we're using this starts with operator that's saying, hey, I want my city state zip to start with NY hash, which means I want all the stores in New York. And if we go back to our table, that's going to match these three items here, which has three different Starbucks stores in New York. That first one's in Albany. The next two are in New York City. But then you can imagine we want to get even more granular than that. We want to search not just within the state of New York. We want to look at New York City. So again, we have this same query here. And all we've done is change this expression attribute value so that the prefix is NY hash and then New York City to get us just the New York City stores. If we go back to our table here, now we've gone down from three items down to two. We've only matched those two New York City stores. But we can get even more granular than that. If we go back to that query, now we can change the prefix to be NY hash New York City hash and then the zip code that we want because we want to get a specific zip code in New York City. When we go back to our table, we see that we only match that one item that has that state, city, and zip code that we want. So that's the composite sort key pattern. And what you're doing there is you're encoding multiple values into that sort key to build out this hierarchy. And this is good when you have multiple levels of hierarchy. So you have a one-to-many relationship that has a one-to-many relationship and maybe has another one-to-many relationship. Now, it's not going to work in all situations there because let's go back to that SaaS example where we had an organization that has users and then we also added in users have tickets. And the big problem there is that when searching at a particular level in the hierarchy, we didn't want to get all the nested levels as well. So that's the key here. When searching at that particular level in the hierarchy, you want all the sub items. When we're searching for a particular city, we want all the zip codes in that city. That's not always going to be true like that SaaS app. So you need to use this strategy sparingly. Finally, let's wrap up what we covered in this chapter. First of all, we looked at what is a one-to-many relationship. We saw a few different examples of those. And then we walked through the five different strategies for one-to-many relationships in DynamoDB. And those first two strategies both use denormalization. There's denormalization with a complex attribute and denormalization by duplicating da data. The second two strategies are pretty similar and that's where you use a composite primary key, whether that's in your primary key or in a secondary index. You combine multiple different item types into a single item collection and you use that query to fetch both of those at once. You sort of pre-join your data. Finally, that last example we have there is that composite sort key where you're encoding multiple levels of a hierarchy into that sort key that allows you to search at different levels within that hierarchy. In the next chapter, we're gonna take a look at many to many relationships, so check that one out.